Yeah, I didn't understand. You know, I didn't understand the seriousness, uh, seriousness of it. Turn the mic's on, and we're on. <laughs> okay. What? Well, do I need to push this thing off? It's time for us to get started. Tom, come over here and stand next to me so the mic can pick me up. Okay. <laughs> it's time for us to get started this morning. <coughs> Brother uh, Tommy Thomas is teaching our class this morning, so I need to adjust the camera about a foot yeah. over my head because he's taller than me. Uh, Brother Tommy Thomas from the Pine Mountain Valley Congregation is going to be teaching the lesson Insidious Influences, and our series on uh, how a church changes has a few more lessons left. Uh, we we uh, uh, missed a couple of months in, in, in the course of the series for different reasons, and uh, that was my lesson and Jonathan's lesson got skipped. And so instead of coming back and uh, coming back to those lessons, because we already had everybody scheduled, I didn't want to mess up the schedule, so I just, the ones that I missed, I just moved them to the end of the schedule. So I'll still have my lesson, and Jonathan will still have his lesson. It'll just be at the end of the schedule. So uh, the schedule will continue as normal. Uh, me and Jonathan will have our lessons tacked on to the end of, of the schedule that had been uh, established previously. And um, there's, I think, maybe four more lessons altogether. So uh, if anybody has any suggestions of a series that you'd like to do when this one is over, uh, be sure and let me know that, and, and we'll, we'll get that lined up, get teachers planned for it, and uh, be ready to go into that series when this one is over. All right? Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll turn the time over to Brother Tommy. Our Holy Father, we're thankful for this day that thou hast blessed us with. We're thankful for this time that we had to be together in the study of thy word, and we pray, Father, that as we study together, we might grow in our knowledge of Thee and also in our resolve to serve Thee according to Thy will, to only do those things that we know are pleasing unto Thee, that Thou hast revealed for us to do, and to avoid those things that are products of our own uh, ingenuity or uh, our own inventing. We know, Father, that Thou hast revealed to us every right and good way, the way that Thou would have us to worship Thee and to serve Thee and to work for Thee in this world, and we pray that we would hold to that pattern that has been revealed and not stray from it. We're thankful for those represented here and the resolve of every one of those that are here to stand for the truth and to follow Thy will in all that Thou hast said. We pray that Thou would continue to be with us, keep us healthy and strong in Thy service. Be with the congregations that are represented here. Help us to grow and to serve thee in a way that would bring glory to thy high and holy name. And we give thee all the thanks and all the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Did you, uh, Norm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Norm. Well, I appreciate very much you being here. Appreciate being selected to bring a lesson. It's my fault that I picked this lesson because in my 83 years of living, I don't never heard the word insidious, nor I knew what it meant. Uh, but my lesson uh, today is insidious influences and so by looking at the definition on your cover sheet it's unpleasant or dangerous and develops gradually without being noticed having a gradual and cumulative effect in a way that gradually and secretly causes harm developing so gradually as to be well established before becoming apparent well, in looking at the definition, then I could talk about anything. The church where I'm located, 
for the last six months, we have been uh, studying in our Wednesday night class that I teach, the 70 AD theory. We started out with authority, 70 AD theory, and then we started out with change agents. This is one of the lessons that I'm going to talk about today, is the change agents, or the movement, and I'm going to talk about the assault on worship. Because let's face it, within the church, there, there are those that bring up things from time to time that we need to study, study it out, come to uh, understanding of the Word of God on the matter. And then there are those that come in that bring in doctrines that we need to study. And so these are that I would have never thought in all of my Christian life of 63 years now of having to deal with subjects like this. First time that I ever come across some problems, really big problems, was I was preaching at a place in Pensacola, Florida, where Frank was baptized. Of course, that's 20 years later. <laughs> and there was a doctor from the Navy who was stationed there on the flat top, aircraft carrier, and he just gave us a fit. And I was living in Fort Walton. I was in the military. And they had contacted me to come over and preach for them until their regular preacher uh, came, and that was about six months later. And so I would go across the bridge there in Pensacola and look out at the water and just hope that that aircraft carrier was gone. That's how much, because this man just really bringing up stuff that I never heard of. I was a young man. Well, I'm an old man. I still think, hear things that I've never heard before. But much of the change that's been promoted among the Lord's church today is centered around worship. These changes include church music, lifting up hands, hand clapping, drama, the female leadership, observing religious holidays. We had a young man who was in the Army, and he was going to Germany, and I told him where to go for services in Germany. And he'd been there a while, but he didn't go. He went to another church. And he said at Christmas time, they put a cake on the Lord's table to celebrate the Lord's birthday. What should you do? I told him the Bible says to come out from above him. And so you have these changes like this. Well, dedicating babies, observing religious holidays, the Lord's Supper, Sunday night cluster groups, children's worship, preaching style, and worship environment. Well, one can see that the primary objective of these changes, agents, is to uh, renovate or restructure the worship practices of the church. Let's say, a friend of mine, when I first obeyed the gospel in South Carolina in 1959, he sort of took me under his wings, and we would study together all the time. And he told me, he was a much older man, of course I was just in my uh, 20s, and he told me, he said, Tommy, this is what's going to happen. Well, as you know, we don't have prophets in the church. But he said, this is what's going to happen, and you're going to see it. And, you know, I said, you know, Coming out of a denomination, I said, not the Lord's church. It's not going to happen. Well, it goes back to this insidious influences. And, and, you know, as the years went by, that's what I saw. I saw these things coming. You have to deal with them. Sometimes you have to leave. 
and go somewhere else if you cannot stop it. Well, what does the Bible say regarding acceptable worship? Well, it begins and ends with worship. In Matthew 4.10, Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Look at the end then, Revelation 22 and verse 9. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. What did he say? Worship God. Worship God. There's at least four kinds of worship that we see in the New Testament. There's ignorant worship. In Acts 17, 23, as far as I was passing through, uh, uh, passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the Unknown God. You know, there, far on Mars Hill. You know, there was a, a banyu for every god, and then there was one to the unknown god. And he said, Therefore, if the one you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Well, there's vain worship, Matthew 15, 9. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Then there's will worship in Colossians 2, 23. These things in need have I uh, an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no vain uh, value against the indulgence of the flesh. Then there's their spiritual worship. Looking at John 4, 24, God is the Spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And you know, inherent in each one of these kinds of worship is authority. You start off with this. Do you believe in God? Why, yes. Do you believe in the Scriptures? Why, yes. Do you believe that you have to do what the Bible says? Why, yes. And then you say something and say, oh, no, I don't believe that. Well, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Jesus emphasized this in John 4, 23 and 24. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father <clears throat> is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those, those that who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, think about that just for a moment. Correct worship possesses the proper audience. Who's that? That's God. In Ephesians 5 and 19 and 20, true worshipers worship God. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it has that proper spirit, attitude, the spirit. Ephesians 5, 19, again, in your heart. Psalms 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. <clears throat> I don't know if most of you know that my good wife, she, when I married her and Looking back over it now, you know, maybe she, she shouldn't have married me. I wasn't a Christian. But I tried to tell people you ought to marry a Christian. But she married me, and then she started teaching me. And then a preacher started on me. And when I obeyed the gospel, coming out of a denomination, I thought, this is great. You know, never read the Bible like this. 
denomination I came out of said, well, you don't have to have your Bible. Preachers going to tell you what you need to know. Well, now I'm doing it for myself. You know, now that I'm a Christian, I'm looking at it. And I've got to come to grips with it. And all these years, 63 years, I've tried to stay true to the Word of God. Worshiping in spirit takes zeal. It takes effort. But the current climate in the church tends to treat worship as a time of entertainment. And the worshiper and catering to the worshiper's needs, we call that felt needs. You know, it's changed, brethren. No wonder the Bible says there will be few. Many will go ahead, but there will be few that find the truth. But many will go the wrong way. As a result, many worshipers have lost the deep, reverent uh, mindset to please God, not self. You know, as we look to what we've studied today, insidious influences, there are those that come in and try to influence us to do something else. And, you know, they want to be like the world today. So what if they don't ask for a king? But, of course, they think the preacher is the king, but the preacher's like anybody else. When I uh, first obeyed the gospel and then I became a preacher, I'd wait on the Lord's Supper once in a while, wait on the table. And someone said, well, you should do that. I'm no different than brother so-and-so over here. Well, you're the preacher. That doesn't make me any different. And so Sunday we had a, uh, last Sunday we had a guest speaker. And so I said, I'll take the Lord's Supper. They were giving out uh, instructions on who, do, do, who will do this. And I said, I'll take the Lord's Supper. And someone said, you think he remembers what to say? <laughs> well, uh, I got through it, you know. But I did, I, it, it was funny. One of the brethren got up and came down because, you know, I can't walk that good. And they said, I'll pass it out for you. <laughs> I appreciated that, but I could have made it. But... You know, the lax attitude, especially evident the change that has come over many congregations with regards to dress. Sometimes people come with their pajamas on, I think. They look like pajamas. And much of the casual clothing worn in the local church simply is a direct manifestation of a casual attitude towards worship. You know, even at a funeral you see this now. Come in the pajamas. Worshippers are wearing casual clothing that would not, they would not think of wearing at a wedding, some at even a funeral, or even jury duty. Well, dress unquestionably reflects attitude. Proper actions of truth, worship must be done, decency and in order. That's why we don't jump over the benches. In decency and in order, First Corinthians 15:40, acceptably Hebrews 12 and verse number 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear. Well, this current assault on worship includes an attempt to dodge the clear import of the expression in truth. Some are falsely saying that in truth in simply a Hebrewism meaning to worship sincerely and devote, uh, devotely, uh, but let's notice God's view on the matter of truth. He's always, he's always required uh, essentially two facets. 
of response to his will, the right action with the right attitude. John 4, 24 again. Joshua 24, verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him sincerely and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers have served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Acts 10, 35. But in every nation, whoever fears uh, him and works righteousness is acceptable by him. Let me just stop there. You know, we don't have fear anymore. People don't fear God anymore. Well, I'll tell you something. There's coming a day when we will stand before him and give an account for what we've done, whether it be good, whether it be bad. I'm not saying, you know, I know the Bible says we must come boldly before God, but we come boldly when we know the truth. That's what he expects. People are not converted anymore. You know, we, we drag them up out of the water onto the riverbank, and sometimes we just leave them there. And they have to fend for themselves. We've got to continue on teaching. That's why we have Bible study Sunday morning, Bible study Wednesday night. That's why we have a gospel meeting. We don't have, you know, we can't just leave them there on the riverbank. We've got to continue to teach them. We've got to ground them in the truth. And when you do that, you've got someone for life. And when they come to the end of life, you know, the preacher could stand up Again, not knowing everything, but he can say to the best of my knowledge, this person was a true child of God. It's sad when we have to um, preach a funeral and the fellow's been a rascal. Of course, what we say won't hurt him or help him, but it's very sad. So, uh, Romans 1 9 says, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. See, to, to emphasize on the mention of obedience over another is to hamper one's acceptance by God. God has not changed in his insistence upon man's loving obedience. And his instructions, that's why he says, if you love me, John 14, 15, keep my commandments. And John 15, 14 says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. In 1 John, the fifth chapter in verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. The psalmist understood that God's truth consisted of God's written word. In the first one there, first verse uh, mentioned, in Psalm 1930, says, I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. And I think Jesus taught the same thing. John 17, 17, when he says, Sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. And certainly when we look at John 12, verse 47 and 48, anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him the same. The words that I've spoken will judge him in the last day. You know, we might just cast it aside. 
You know, if, if the world came out and the leaders would say, all the Bibles are going to be burned, all the books that make quotations will be destroyed, every person who can quote passages of Scripture, they're going to be put away. It'd still be their judges. John 12. Worshiping God in truth is equivalent to doing truth, which entails deeds or external actions which are prescribed by God. We've got to be doing something. You know, a person told me one time, he said, you know, well, worship is boring. And I tell him, I say, look here. It's boring because you didn't put anything into it. If you don't put anything into worship, you don't get anything out of it. You'll accept everything that comes down the pike. And that's sad. That is so sad. Because people come in and they try to influence. People will come and they watch television. And they'll say, well, this is what the man said on television. And I, I sort of believe it. Well, did you consult the Word of God to see if that was true? You know, we're not putting something in. We're not getting anything out of it. Well, the singing's terrible. Did you sing? No. What about prayer? Did you give a hearty amen when someone prayed? That means that's for me too. What about giving? You know, did you reach in your pocket for a dime, hoping it'd be a nickel that you pull out? See, that's an act of worship. What about taking the Lord's Supper? Had one person come one time and said, Tommy, I've got my sister with me and said, could you talk to her about the Lord's Supper while we partake of it? I said, I don't mind telling you what the Bible says. But I said, let me ask you a question. How long have you been a member of the church? He said, six, six years or more. You don't know why you take of it? I'll talk to her. But you should be able to tell her. See, we're just not growing. We've left on the riverbank. You know, we haven't been paying attention to what the preacher says. We haven't been checking him by the Bible. And if he says something, we haven't asked him, explain that to me again. Or we get mad, we leave. Sometimes it goes, it just goes over some people's heads. That's wrong. You know, we're going to give it a count. We don't realize that, we're going to give it a count. person was asked, pretty high up individual, owned a television station. He was asked, what do you think of heaven? He says, I think it'd be boring. Let me tell you something. He's not going. <laughs> he won't make it. If we take that type of attitude, we won't go either. You know that's why the fields are white ready. That's why we have a big responsibility. Now, I grant you, we've got to, uh, when we start talking to somebody, we've got to talk to them about the battle of Armageddon, the tribulation. You've got to get all of that out of their system. Or we've got to talk to them about music. One fellow said, well, I think that comes up every time. Why don't you folks use instruments of music? Well, we already read in Ephesians 5. Where in the Bible does it say that we do that today? See, we've got to talk to them about that. But usually when you start off and you've got an honest soul that's willing to listen, whether he's been talked to by somebody else, and after you get too down to the subject of music, you don't have any trouble. Well, 
instead of trying to ruin services, ruin our relationship with God, but let's look at some tendencies. Any questions? Let's look at some tendencies now. Some churches are operating on the basis of inappropriate, unbiblical objectives and goals. Some churches have worship committees and praise teams and apparently have no clue as to what their real responsibility is to plan and instruct, structure worship so that the focus is on God, not the worshiper. In keeping with the tone and tenor of our entertainment craze culture, some in the church feel that worship ought to be entertaining. The denominational church down the road from us, they have all these uh, groups that come in. Their bus will be out front and they'll have a packed audience because they, they're there to save for them. Well, why don't you do that? Give me the authority to do it. Where is the authority to do something like that? Well, can't we see that entertaining ourselves, satisfying our own needs, reviving our interests to escape our boredom, and attempting to attract others with these man-made lure are all simply unbiblical, cheap, inferior substitutes for simple, meaningful spiritual worship. Instead of attempting to renovate worship for our own benefit, what we need to do is cultivate our, aptitude, uh, our uh, appetites for pure New Testament worship. We need to stick with the simple worship that are dictated by the scriptures. We need to learn to like them because they are good for us. If we insist them, resist them and look for new and exciting ways to worship, we're showing a childhood rebellion. And brethren, this is real worship, Colossians 2.23. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility, neglect of the body, but of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. If worship has become so boring and unmeaningful, then a member so much so that he feels the need to change where he's going to liven up the worship assembly with theatrics. He has a spiritual internal problem. He's got a heart problem. Repetitiveness and sameness are not inherently bad. You know. Brethren, there are those that come in and try to influence this. We went through the crossroads problems a number of years ago. Churches just flocked to that teaching because they said they just growing with leaps and bounds. They had their prayer partners. When you get into prob a problem, you just go to your prayer partner. He'll pray for you. They had other things. Young men, 12, 13 years old, would obey the gospel, and of course their parents were not members. And the preacher said, you don't have to listen to your parents. We had a church there in Columbus, Ohio, which was a crossroads church. And so the parents called on the police, and the preacher went to jail. Because he alienated his, their child against them. It's big down. 
but it's mostly in big uh, metropolitan areas where there's a big college. It's almost like the the Boonies. You know, that was a, a cult group. And, you know, and, and others. But if we expect the church to grow, we've got to go strictly by what God says, strictly by the Bible. And when someone comes in and and tries to influence the congregation or tries to influence an individual, we've got to be ready to teach them what the Bible says. Because we've lost some like that. In Ohio, we had a preacher one time that was preaching, says, don't give me the church. Give me Jesus. Well, <laughs> if you have Jesus, you got the church. And if you got the church, you got you got Jesus. You can't dismiss that. That's right. If it was important enough to die for, it better be important enough to care for. That's right. when you take that away they're going to leave what did you come for in the first place Wednesday night Bible study has turned into pizza night. Driving over here this morning before I picked up Paul, I heard this on the radio, uh, and I thought it was pretty good. A church alive is worth the drive. <laughs> you know, because really, truly, we, we, we have people that drive pretty good days. This, well, worship has come under attack by the agents, change agents. We shouldn't fall for them. They pray on to these voices who wish to resist softening the instructions of God. And really and truly, may God help us to worship Him in accordance with his will. We need to be ready to give an answer for every hope that lies within us. Well, that's your lesson. And maybe we haven't said exactly a lot of things, but anything that's foreign, we've got to be ready to answer and give a Scripture for any comments? You know, I think about insidious influences, which which is kind of hard to understand. But uh, the influence.
influences are everywhere right now. And even you you run into people that want to uh, to be a Christian. I mean, they, they claim to be Christians, but they'll go through channels on TV or through the Internet, and what are they looking at? There are so many different beliefs that go on that, you know, where do you find the right one? That's right. I mean, the only way you can tell whether it's true or not is to go back to the Bible. But, and they don't want to do that. They just simply want to listen to whatever they're watching on TV. And the fancier it is, gets more of the, the biggest uh, attention. And it seems as though it's that entertainment factor that grabs their attention. That's right. his button more? Uh, no, just on okay, could you take about 20 pounds off of that picture? I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you for a good lesson. Our updated schedule after Tommy's lesson Today will be Steve next month on the 10th with uh, changes in leadership. And then the lesson that I was supposed to have had uh, in April, is that right? The lesson that I was supposed to have had in April will be on October 8th, and that lesson, uh, Paving the Way for Change, and then the lesson that Jonathan was supposed to have last month on the 9th will be November 12th, and that lesson will be Telltale Signs of Change. Uh, and so our next series should start on December 10th. So y'all be thinking about uh, what you'd like to, to study after we finish this series that will we'll, uh, start in, de in uh, December. Um, maybe uh, great chapters of the Bible or some other topical study like we've done here or a textual study if there's a book, book of the Bible that you'd like to study like we did Revelation before. Um, we'll, we'll do that and I'll plan the schedule out and we'll get the teachers assigned. Uh, any anything else we need to be updated on before we close? You know, after having the camera set for you, Tommy, and then looking at me on the on the camera, I can really tell how much taller you are than me. <laughs> I got a lot of headspace up here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> anything else before we close? Steve, would you close us with a closing prayer? Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your great and wonderful name. Father, we thank you for this day and another opportunity to come together and learn from your word. We ask that you would bless each one that was here today and those that are watching this lesson uh, on the streaming. Help us to take these things that we learn and use them in our everyday lives to encourage those around us to study and to learn more about you. And Father, now as we're about to depart, we do ask that with each of us and keep us all safe. Help us to recognize opportunities to spread your word and to encourage those that are that maybe have drifted away. Help those that are seeking you and and help us to be able to know the right things to say in order to give them the great encouragement they need. Be with all those that are on our sick and prayer list at this time and, and those that are going to be going into
tests and those that will be traveling. Father, we ask that you would care for all of them. Be with our government and help them to make better decisions. And also, we ask that you continue to keep the diseases away from us. And also, we ask that you would be with those brothers, sisters that we have over in the Ukraine area that are still there that might possibly be in danger. Help them all to be safe. We ask this prayer this morning through Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Uh, those watching on the, the live stream, if there's anything you'd like to add to the, to the uh, suggestions for upcoming series, put that in the comment section. If you're local, we'd love to have you come and visit us for our class on the second Saturday of every month and uh, be here in person, but we're happy to have you watching online. Thanks.